to be here. We're happy to see you. And the rest of you that are still joining us. Um, we want to invite you to worship this morning. We serve a great God, and we want to remind our souls how great he is and who he is. He's on the throne this morning. He's not moved by our circumstance. So we just welcome, we just welcome you, Holy Spirit, to have your way in our worship this morning, God. We lay everything at your feet. We just surrender our lives to you, God. We don't come with our own agenda or our own, um, just our own mindset. We know that you are high above it all, Father, and we want to worship you. So we just, would you just lift your hands? Would you just quiet yourself this morning? Um, set everything aside of your, of your day, of your schedule, of your life. Set it aside and just choose to worship him for who he is today. He is your God. He is eternal life for us. He is salvation. He is righteousness, peace, joy. He is everything we need. And God, would you just have your way in our hearts. In Jesus' name.
Father, in this place of worship, we want to bring you and return to you our tithes and offerings this morning. Father, your word says, honor the Lord with your tithes and your first fruits of all your increase in God this morning. Father, as a declaration of our love and our honor before you, Jesus, we bring our hearts and we bring our tithes and offerings as a declaration of our love and our honor for you. We love you, King Jesus. We bring you our hearts more than anything else this morning. Jesus, not our abilities, but we bring you our hearts this morning, Jesus. Be magnified magnified in the presence of your sons and daughters this morning, Father. Amen. Let me grab a seat. Welcome. If you have not been welcome, welcome to those online. I don't know if you know, but baby Wagner arrived. It's a baby boy Wagner. Strong, healthy, Boy. It's one for the boy team. Yeah. <laughs> Our kids were counting the other day. How many girls have been born? How many boys are still coming? So the surfaces, it's up to you. We're not sure where it's going to land. Um, this coming weekend is Thanksgiving, which is super exciting. We are having our Thanksgiving brunch Sunday morning. Tickets are available, $15 per person until Wednesday. We need to get final numbers to the caterer on Thursday. So Wednesday is the last day to buy tickets. Um, it's a catered meal. There are no tickets separately for kids, but we do ask families, we ask parents to just decide how many adult meals you need for your family and then buy those tickets accordingly. How many of you know that Saturday night is the Victorious Festival at the BMO Center? It's a big thing in our city and I remember a few months ago we had the, I think it was in May or April, we had the organizers Land of Hope at our ministerial meeting and they shared their hearts for this event and on June 10th they had the Victorious Festival in um, Toronto and they had Chris Tomlin and Lecrae and Flame. And we have Michael W. Smith and Lecrae and Flame. And um, I watched some of the videos last night of the Toronto one and it was wild. <laughs> I'm gonna be there at five. The doors open at six though. But um, if you haven't got your tickets yet and you don't have a turkey dinner planned for Saturday night, I would encourage you to come. It's a big outreach in our city, really, to um, trust God for many people to get saved. It's going to be a great event, and I want us to pray for that this morning. Would you grab a hand next to you, and let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the beautiful city that we can live in. Jesus, I thank you this morning for incredible organizations and groups like Land of Hope that has a heart to um, bring quality artists and share the gospel through music. So Father, I thank you for this weekend. I thank you for the preparations that's been going into it and the prayer. God, I trust you that in this city we will see many come to Jesus, come to meet the King of Kings Saturday night as the call goes out and as there's an opportunity for people to give their hearts to you. Father, I thank you that we would see the harvest come in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Um, we're going to release the kids right now. Kids Connection, I'm going to call John to come up. Today is a very exciting day as we kick off our new series on core values. John's going to kick us off. Thanks, John. Are you getting me? You 
you are. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you, worship team. Appreciate it. I so appreciated that song uh, of benediction today, and, and I just wanted to confirm that as we've been praying for you as couples and as families and as a church, we've really, really felt that God's heart in this season was to strengthen you. And we believe that we are being strengthened. We want to encourage you to position yourselves well. If you don't hear anything else today, I do hope you hear other things today. But if you don't hear anything else today, hear this, that God is for you and is in, in the process of positioning you to be more than conquerors in Him. And that is the reason that we're doing everything that we're doing. That is the reason that we are preaching through the values. That's the reason that we gave out those resources for apologetics, uh, for your kids, for your teens, for you yourselves. That is the reason that we are going through the glorious churches. We believe that when we are strong in who we are and whose we are, that we will live victoriously and we will live in strength. And so we say we believe in you. We are for you. Um, and we want to encourage you to adjust your heart in that and look out for what God is doing uh, in and through this season. Uh, there was a recent trend going around on TikTok and Instagram. Don't ask me why I know about this trend. Uh, but it was encouraging women to ask the men in their lives how much they think about the Roman Empire. Has, has anybody heard this trend? Give me a... Oh yeah, so a few have. So, okay, so... If you haven't heard about the trend, think about it for a minute, men. Think about how often you actually think about the Roman Empire. And women, think, you think, what, what, what do you think would be a reasonable answer? So, this prompted women to everywhere to ask their husbands and brothers and boyfriends, how much do you think about the Roman Empire? And a lot of, a lot of these women actually secretly recorded these conversations. And the growing consensus was that it was almost as much as once per day. That may shock some people. This did a lot of good things for my heart, though, because, number one, it made me feel a lot less weird than I feel a lot of the time. Sometimes I feel like I'm a weirdo. And to know that there are other weird men thinking about these things did a lot of good things for my heart. Number two, though, it, it did my heart good to, to know that so many of my fellow men are concerned about culture and history and thinking through those things. You know, there's this tired old trope uh, that, that runs in sitcoms and movies about how, how men are stupid and, and, and they're the ones that just, you know, they think about beer and sports and that's kind of the thing. And I, I think that that trope needs to die. But, but it, it did my heart good to hear how many people uh, were actually thinking about history and culture on a regular basis. We, of course, are starting our new series on values, uh, and I want to start by talking about culture. Uh, our culture is made up by our values, um, and we're going to dig into some of what makes us us as Life Connection Church and Church of the Nations. And as I said, I, I trust that in this series you will be both strengthened and encouraged to shift the way that you look at some things. And in doing so, when you do that, God can do phenomenal things in your life. So we in the modern West are living in what is often defined as Western culture. Western culture is indisputably the most successful culture that this world has ever produced. And we can trace that success of Western culture back through, uh, through Europe, through the Industrial Revolution and the Renaissance, through Rome and, and the advancements that they made in uh, sanitation and law, and eventually to the ancient Greeks. If you don't know much about the ancient Greeks, uh, so much of what we know today and continue to build upon has its roots in ancient Greece. Our understanding of things like philosophy, logic, reason, mathematics, astronomy, the empirical method, energy production, mining, construction, measurement, all kinds of these things started in ancient Greece. And the ancient Greeks were absolutely enthralled with their culture. They loved their culture. It was called Hellenistic culture. They believed so much in their culture that they thought it was their moral obligation to bring their culture to the rest of the world. They called the process Hellenization. We're bringing this Greek culture to the rest of the world. And the fact that what we have today is continuing to be built upon those foundations that were laid is a testament to the strength of that culture. 
Today we celebrate Alexander the Great and his incredible victories. I don't know if there's any Alexander the Great fans out there. I enjoy Alexander the Great and his stories. Um, the most notable of his victories would be the Battle of Issus, in which he led approximately 40,000 Greeks, 40,000 Macedonians, up against the juggernaut that was the Persian Empire. Historians estimate that there was anywhere up to 120,000 Persians facing off against 40,000 Macedonians. If you know the story, Alexander won a resounding victory that day, and it's something that we still look back at and celebrate. Historians like to, to pick that apart and say, what was the thing that won the Greeks the victory that day? And, and many, many times Alexander would go up against uh, overwhelming odds and come out winning. And we pick apart things like we can look at military tactics. We can look at uh, the weaponry that was used and how it was used. You, they will look at the companion cal cavalry and how they were used as shock troops. And those are really, really fun discussions. But in, in, inevitably, there is a, a sense of inspiration that they can't quite put their fingers on. And that's the really fun part to think about. There's this sense of the Greeks were so united and so tight as a unit. They believed so much in who they were and what they were doing and the fellow person standing beside them that, that they were able to win in an overwhelming situation. The Persians, while they were overwhelmingly a larger force, were disjointed and, and, and disunified. They were a collection of many, many satrap states and, and vassal states, and they didn't always have the same unity. And so when put to the test, they fell apart in front of the Greeks. You see, culture is powerful. Many would say that culture is not as strong as the sword, but culture can define when you pick up the sword. It can define how you use the sword, and most importantly, why you're fighting in the first place. Culture is powerful, and culture, more than anything, is shaped by our shared values. Jesus did not come to this world simply to establish a religion. He did not come to this world to simply start church services. Jesus came into this world to usher in the kingdom of God. In fact, it's what he said over and over and over again. I tell you the truth, the kingdom of God is here. John the Baptist said the kingdom of God is near. Jesus said the kingdom of God is here. So Jesus preached the kingdom. And that kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, just like any other kingdom, has a culture which is shaped by shared values. And so today we are starting our new series on kingdom values. And they are the values that define us as the Church of the Nations uh, in general and us as Life Connection Church specifically. But before we get into that, I want to draw a really clear distinction between kingdom values and corporate values. You see, many of us, when we hear about values, we immediately relate to corporate or business values. We are steeped in such a consumeristic culture that when we hear values, we often think to businesses. Many businesses today have, have corporate values. It doesn't that seem to matter if you're fixing washing machines or you're selling automobiles. Every business seems to want to have their own set of corporate values. And I think that the popularization of corporate values has done a lot of good in the world of commerce. Uh, but it has also diluted our view of values and what function they actually serve. See, corporate values tend to be two specific things. Number one, they tend to be cliché. Number two, they tend to be aspirational. They are clichéd in the sense that they use common and almost formulaic ideas, but rarely reflect anything of true substance. And they tend to be aspirational in the sense that they are a collection of ideas that we generally put out there. That we say, these are things that we should aspire to. These are good values to have, but they are not deep-rooted convictions. This is not the same as kingdom values. When we talk about kingdom values, we are talking about the very culture of heaven. And we as Christians should seek to be aligned with that culture. See, it's not enough for us as Christians simply to know the scriptures. If you doubt me in that, think about Satan. He knows the scriptures a heck of a lot better probably than you do. 
No, what we need to do is allow the scriptures to shape our thinking and our habits. We need the scriptures to penetrate deeply into our hearts until we begin to value the things that God values, until we begin to see things the way that God sees them. And when you position yourself in that way, humbly, and you seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, you begin to invite the rule and the reign of God into your life. And he begins to put things in right in your life, from your families, to your finances, to your workplaces, to your relationships, to your priorities. When you humble yourself and seek his kingdom in that way, he begins to reorient your direction. And you begin to do his work, and you begin to reflect his ways. See, we all want to do the work of God. But friends, I want to tell you that there is a power and there is a richness in the ways of God. There is a blessing and authority when we carry out and walk in the ways of God. David says this in Psalm 25, Teach me your ways, O Lord. Make them known to me. Teach me to live according to your truth. For you are my God who saves me. There's a beauty and a depth, not just in doing his work, but in doing it in his ways. You see, when we talk about true kingdom values, we're not talking about cliches or aspirations. These are not ideas that we put up on a vision board and say, hey, wouldn't it be nice if we had that? No, true kingdom values can't be just conjured up or dreamed up. They have to be uncovered. And as Peter often told us, they are not simply laying in wait for casual inquirers. See, if you just want to go to heaven, if you just want to punch your ticket to heaven, all you have to do, as Paul says, is confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead. And my friends, that is a beautiful thing to do. And if you've never done that, that is absolutely what you need to do today. But that is what you need to do to be saved. If you really just want a ticket to heaven, it's simple. But if you want the kingdom of God in your life, if you want the literal rule and reign of God to come into your life and through your life, it's going to cost you something. Kingdom values are refined in us to the extent that we are willing to lay our lives down. Krista, can you cue that picture up? So with that said, <laughs> I could go on and talk to you about, about certain values today, but what I'd rather do is tell you some stories about where our kingdom values came from and how they were uncovered. And I'm going to be talking to you about the people on the slide behind me. As you know, uh, we believe in being submitted and accountable to godly authority, and in our case, we are rooted specifically in Church of the Nations, and Church of the Nations is overseen by this lovely group of people that you see behind me, uh, called the Apostolic Council. Now, some of you have met these people, and some of you may have no idea who these people are. But I can tell you, as somebody who's met these people, who's listened to these people, who's eaten with these people, that they are the real deal. And I want to tell you some stories about how God worked in their lives to establish true kingdom values. So I'm going to start with Tony Fitzgerald. If you don't know Tony Fitzgerald, he is, he is the founder and father of Church of the Nations. If you've not heard him talk, he's basically got a big grandpa heart up there in the top left. Great grandpa. Hard, hard not to hug the guy, honestly. Now, Tony was raised in a strict Salvation Army background. If you don't know much about William Booth and the history of the Salvation Army, it's a very, very rich history. William Booth was a fiery and passionate man who had a heart for the poor and the marginalized. He would do these big tent meetings and revivals, ministering to the downtrodden people that were walking by, powerful, powerful revivals. They would wear army uniforms because they actually viewed themselves as an army. They were winning people to salvation. That's where the name, where the Salvation Army, uh, strong, strong message and history. And Tony was raised in, in a very, very strict Salvation uh, Army uh, church. 
Um, and as I said, had a very, very powerful legacy, but like many things over the years, uh, began to wear down and, and lost some of that flavor that it had. And Tony found himself as a young man in a very religious setting, going to church four times on Sunday and twice through the week, which as he described was driven by a lot of activity, but not necessarily a lot of power. And he tells a story about when he was dropped off at a local college bar to do ministry. So it's a college bar, a bunch of college kids there, drinking and having a good time. And he went there to minister the gospel, to talk to people, to evangelize. And he was wearing his officer's uniform, wearing his army uniform. And he went into this bar uh, to talk to people about Jesus. And as he tried to witness to people, he began to realize that he was getting no traction. As he described it, he said he had nothing of substance to share. See, he had the message, as he described it. But he didn't have the power and the substance behind it. And he walked out of that bar feeling dejected and humiliated. He hung his head and he walked home in his Salvation Army uniform. And he said he never wanted to feel that way again. Have you ever felt that way in your life? That you had the message, but you didn't have the power or the substance behind it to properly reach into the people around you. I felt that way a lot. And so Tony began to seek hard, and what he found was the message of the kingdom. And as he gave his life to God in ministry, he began to see God pour out his spirit in power. He saw people being delivered of demonic possession. He saw people healed. He saw so many young adults totally change the direction of their lives, be raised up and empowered and sent out to have powerful ministries of their own. And there's just this beautiful message that God is not done with us. The message of the kingdom, uh, many of you have heard today. There's countless books about it. There's sermon series about it. There's tons of businesses about it. I, I know three kingdom builders. I feel like everybody wants that. We're kingdom business. We're this. We're that. We're, we're kingdom. But in those days, nobody was talking about the kingdom. But as people started to minister and seek God, Tony describes there's different people all around the world just started popping up with the same message. It was that message of the kingdom. And the message was this, that God didn't come to just give us tickets to heaven, but that he came to establish his rule and his reign in people's lives. And that he has been active and continues to be active in confirming his word with signs, wonders, and miracles. And so Tony is a sign to us of that message of the kingdom and what it means. David Kate, on the other end there, went into the wilderness to seek God. He felt that God was calling him into the wilderness. He came back with a vision that was so crazy that the rest of the apostolic council said, this is either from God or you've gone insane. And David believed that it was his, God was calling him to take a life-size cross and bowl and a large water jug. He carries this cross, if you've ever seen him. Uh, it, is, it is a life-size cross and it has a bowl on the front. And he said, God has called me to walk with this thing and to stop and minister to people along the way, to wash their feet in a sign of love. And over the years, he has gone from some of the most populated centers into the world to some of the most remote, remote places on earth. Everywhere that he's went, he's led people to Jesus. He's fed the hungry. He's healed the sick. He's ministered to lepers and refugees and some of the most broken people. But he's also been invited to minister to heads of state in some places where Christians aren't allowed to legally proclaim the gospel. Why is that? Because David is a living reminder of what it means to truly serve others in the way that Christ served the church. He's an example of the fact that you cannot outgive God. You cannot out-sacrifice God. That even when you serve sacrificially and give, that God will provide for you and you won't find yourself in want. He teaches us what it means to see honor in people and to truly honor people. John Schultz, 
was a scientist and a medical doctor, and he was raised in a heavily Dutch Reformed culture, a very religious Dutch Reformed culture. He's a man of logic and reason, a man who's faithful to his theological traditions, but he had a heart after God and was hungry for the things of God. He went to church religiously, but he found a growing sense of yearning for the power of God and for the things of the Spirit. And he just pursued and pursued and pursued, and he was talking about it. He even mentioned that a couple of his fellow doctors pulled him aside and said, Careful, brother. You, if you keep talking about these things of the Spirit, you're going to find yourself in a place of heresy. But he couldn't get rid of this gnawing feeling that there was more for him. And actually tells the story of one night when he was on shift at the hospital. He ran into the little chapel that was within the hospital that he was working in. He, he fell on his knees and he just opened his heart to God. And God poured out his spirit upon him. And the Holy Spirit came on him and he was baptized in the spirit. And for years he has ministered from that place of power and authority. He still has a deep understanding of the scientific world and of theology but he also carries a depth in the Spirit. He is a reminder to us that when we read the Bible, we don't just read it to gain knowledge, but to transform our hearts and lives through the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And he's a reminder that God always confirms his word with signs and wonders. Now, if we had time, I could tell you story after story of these people. But my purpose today is to try to strengthen you with hope because I want to tell you that God is in the process of writing our story right. as well. You may not always see it, you may not always feel it, but I need to remind you that we are rooted in a beautiful family and that these values that we're talking about and will be talking about over the next few months are not just nice sounding ideas, they are our inheritance. They were uncovered through sacrifice. They were not just conjured up these are the people that we were under, and in God's economy, these things are our inheritance. But just like an inheritance, we have a responsibility to position ourselves correctly to receive it. We can't position ourselves like the prodigal son, who disregarded his inheritance, or the older son, who had a heart that was too hard to properly receive it. God's heart is that we would properly position ourselves, receive the inheritance, and build upon it. There's a, a story in the Bible that occurs well into Jesus' ministry. And Jesus at this point has done some incredible feats. Just to list a couple, he's raised a child from the dead. He's delivered a demon-possessed man. He's also done some incredible teachings and delivered some parables. And he's gained quite a reputation and a following at this point. And the story, as many of you know, he returns home to Nazareth and he, he ministers to the people that he grew up with. And he goes to the synagogues, as was his usual tradition, and begins to minister to people uh, and teach about the scriptures. And they notice who he is. And they say this specifically, where did this man get these things, they ask. What's this wisdom that has been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles that he is performing? See, they recognize the marks of God on his life. They recognize his wisdom. They recognize the miracles. But they don't know how to reconcile it with who they know him to be. They say this, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And it says they took offense at him. And Mark notes this, that he could not do many miracles, he just healed a few sick people, and that he was amazed by their lack of faith. And I feel so often that we as the Canadian church find ourselves in that place. See, we know how this church thing works. We come, we feel peace and worship, we encounter his presence, we listen to an encouraging word, and then we go home and go on about our day. It's, but it's easy to forget that every single encounter with Jesus has the potential to change everything about our lives. We read his word and God speaks to us and we are encouraged by that. But it's easy to forget that this is the living word of God. Paul says it's a two-edged sword. 
that every time we encounter the word, it has the potential to cut things out of our lives, set us free, break chains, and destroy the works of the evil one around us. And that's why we wanted to push in to this series on values. Number one, we're hoping that God will use these values to soften and challenge your hearts so that you can encounter him in fresh ways. We love exegetical preaching. You could say, you know, I know so many of you loved uh, when we worked through the Ephesians series. But our hope is that as we talk about these values, that it will change your perspectives, it will change the way in which you encounter his word. And in doing so, we think that it will position you to be hit and encountered by that word in new ways, and that God will begin to strengthen and move through you in that. Number two, we believe that God will use this to strengthen and stabilize families. Because as you become clear in your identities, we trust that God will build you up and strengthen you in families. You will not easily be swayed, as James says, by the things of this world. You will not be tossed to and fro by all of the opinions swirling around you. You will know who you are, and you will know whose you are, and you will build on strong foundations. As David says, he will set your feet on solid ground. He will lamp the, the path before your feet as you step forward. Number three, we believe that God will bring unity and strength to this family. Just like the Macedonians, you may look at our Canadian culture and feel overwhelmed at the sheer volume of people out there, at the opposing opinions against you out there. I believe that we, for many of our, for much of our lives, I know for me, have been told by the world to be quiet. We've been told that everybody else's opinions matter except ours. We've been told not to speak up in public, public affairs or that those aren't our concern. We've been told, go to your little churches, do your little thing, but don't come into this area and don't speak boldly. But as I've been looking at the culture and our Canadian culture, I've realized something. That like the Persians, they are disjointed and disunified. That they have no real culture. That they are bound together by one large thing, and that is consumerism. And consumerism is not strong. Yeah. Yeah. And so I believe, friends, that God is calling us to strengthen this season. Yes. And if we'll take that seriously and position ourselves well, I think we, like the Macedonians, will see incredible victory in his name. Yeah. You've no idea what God can do through a small group of people who knows exactly who they are and are united in heart and vision. God is for you this morning. God is for your families this morning. God is for your success this morning. And God is for you destroying the works of the enemy in and around your life this morning. Yeah. Yeah. So be encouraged this morning, church. I was supposed to preach also about our founding uh, vision of Hebrew versus Greek mentality. And there's so much that I could speak about on that. And you'll hear some of that through the glorious church. But I wanted to encourage you in this. We have to be willing to see things differently. We have to be willing to step outside of that consumeristic mindset. We have to see the church as a family and not just a place where we go to get served and consumed. That's right. We have to see the Word as living and active, and not just something that we read for information. Yeah. So that is why the Hebrew versus Greek mentality really matters. We cannot just come and, and categorize the things and think, if we learn the right things and learn the right information, there we go. We need to position our hearts freshly in front of Him, in front of His kingdom, in front of His Word. And we need to come with new expectations. So my action plans this morning are very simple and very direct. Number one, if you have not read through our values as a church, I want to encourage you to do so. It's going to prime your heart. It's going to get you ready. 
It's right on our website, or if you have our app, it's available on our app as well. So if you have not read through that, read through that. Think about that. If you have questions about it, come and ask us. Let's talk about it. As I said, each one of these values is not something that we just threw on a dream board. They came out of lives that pursued the kingdom, yeah. that laid down their pearls and found the pearl of great price. Number two, look at signing up to a life group if you haven't already. We are going to be going through the Glorious Church. We're really excited about that and how that's going to work together with this sermon series. The Glorious Church is going to come at some of the same things from a different angle, but it's Tony talking about what the church is and what the church is meant to be, and some of how he discovered that, and it's really beautiful. So if you are not signed up to a life group, Look into it. We are going to be going through the Glorious Church. If you miss the odd session, it's not the end of the world. So if you're saying, I don't know, sometimes I can't fit these times into my schedule, that's okay. Get as much of it into you as you can, and you'll be better for it. And number three, I want to encourage you to soften your heart before Him and say to God, what are you saying to me and my family in this season? As I said, when we look at these values, it can change the way we see his church. It can change the way we see his scriptures. It can change the way that we see his activity in our lives. But it will only do that if we are willing to come at it softly and chip away at that hardened heart. If we come at this differently than the average Canadian churchgoer out there with the hardened heart and said, I know how this Jesus thing works. We have to be willing to lay those things down. And come with fresh hearts and say, God, what are you saying to me in this season? And so I don't know where you find yourselves today. I don't know what you're encountering, what you see, what you're facing. I don't know how many disappointments that you carry. But as a first step, I want to invite you to lay those disappointments down. Tess talked powerfully a couple weeks ago about how sometimes we build a case against God in our own hearts. We carry these disappointments. And I want to invite you as a first step, freshly, to lay those things at his feet. To say, God, I don't always understand, but I, I agree that you are always good. I don't always see you, but I confess that you are always active. I don't always understand your word, but I give your word the highest authority in my life because it is the basis of truth. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. And I'm going to ask you to ask God to search your heart. And as he reveals those things, I want to encourage you to just lay them down. If there's a disappointment coming to your mind, just lay it down. Father God, we come to you in humility this morning. God, recognizing that we are not always good, but that you are always good. Recognizing that we often see things in the wrong way, but that your word is the highest authority, high above all. God, would you help us? Would you reveal things to us, God? We ask your Holy Spirit to search us and know us. To convict us, God. Father God, I thank you that your conviction is always calling us higher. It is never to condemn, it's never to knock down. It is always to set us on a stronger path. You always see better things, God. We confess that we are not always good, but that you are always good. God, would you challenge our hearts to come under your word and read it freshly. God, would you challenge us to, to see your word and to come under it and pray and say, I don't understand this, but I, I place this as the highest authority. Amen. I'm going to do a quick...
blessing, benediction, and that's going to be us for today. In line with everything that we've heard today, I pray that the Lord would bless and keep you. I pray that the Lord would cause his face to shine upon you. I pray that the Lord would light a path before your feet and to make you step on strong ground. I confirm that the Lord is always with you, that there is no voice or circumstance that can change that. I confess that his intentions to you are good, and they are always good all the time. And that he goes before you, he is all around you, he is always with you. May you be blessed and carry his presence this week, these next few months, in Jesus' name.